Now hands up when you're ready. Okay. Um, one, two, three, fourth row, black shirt, glasses. Yes. You're actually quite decisive today. Hello? Oh. <laughs> yeah, so a lot of us are afraid to get up here because we realize we're being recorded. And some of us are in very good positions in their life objectively, so we don't really want to have it, you know, end up on YouTube somewhere. And then, you know, everyone is sitting here like, oh my God, this weirdo is on the stage crying. <laughs> so, um,. It's very interesting, I actually came here today. I'm from Detroit, so I drove five hours to get here. I was excited until the weather showed up and then I realized it's gonna be the same everywhere, so not too happy about that. And it's very interesting you opened up your talk today about parents because I actually thought it was gonna be a complete waste of time for me to be here. And I was like, oh, I've been watching your stuff for about two months and I'm like, oh great, I just showed up here. And, now I just wasted all this money and I drove this far for no reason. And... I feel so loved. <laughs> I'm sorry. Um, so it's very interesting. I've actually been going through that whole emotional process of really trying to understand why I feel like shit most of the time. And I, I work with a therapist weekly. I've been working with one for about two years. And I came to kind of a realization that I don't want to be here. Mm. I never wanted to be here. Um, Interesting story about my birth. My mom's mom thought that I was a mistake. So she was punching my mother in the stomach to try to have her have a miscarriage. Instead of having a miscarriage, I came out two weeks late. So I did not want to be here at all and I still ended up here. So I've just been fighting forever. And the scariest part about this emotional process is you know, there are days where I feel okay, I feel good, I can interact and be normal, and then there are days like today where I kind of just want to slam my car into a tree. Mm -hmm. So, um, I, guess, I guess even though I understand the process of like living in that moment to try to prevent yourself from actually going there, I do that on a regular basis. So it's kind of, it's really bothering me because I'm, I'm going to a professional. I just kind of feel like nobody would know. I'd just be, I've, I went to a psychic and they even pretty much said that, yeah, you know, you're only here because you want to be right now. But you know that if you didn't want to be here, then it'd be. So how do I stop that? How do I try to move through this process without stopping in the middle of it and then restarting again? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Why should you not stop it and restart it in the middle of it? I don't know. <laughs> if I knew, well, then... well, you Well, that's the thing. You have to have some reason why you want it to not be like that. What's that reason? Because from a universal perspective, what you're doing looks totally different than what you feel like you're doing. What does the universe say I'm doing? The universe sees you sort of like a little ant that is finally doing the right thing, which is constantly reevaluating whether you want to go the way you're going. You see? <laughs> now, why might the universe like that? We'll talk about the painful aspect of it later, but I need you to see this first. Why is that good? Well, I guess from universal perspective, I've finally sort of understood things that are happening and I'm beginning to make an effort to address them. No, it's better, come, I need you, come. I'm gonna show you this even better, ready? Okay. <laughs> Okay, 
this is what I need you to do. You're going to be playing him. And so what I want you to be doing is I want you to, as if every five steps you're going to stop and reevaluate whether you even want to be here. Okay, now, and I'm going to be everyone else. Okay, so come in front of him so he can All see. Right. We're going through life. This is the timeline called life. Which one of us is more awake? Which one of us is more the problem? What did you just understand? Okay, who represents whom? So he's me and you're everyone else. Mm -hmm. Okay. I'm the people that aren't suicidal currently. <laughs> oh man, come on. <laughs> um. Well, the major thing I paid attention to was that you just kept kind of walking, but what was didn't... what was animating me? I don't know. You were just floating like you were dead. Oh my god, <laughs> he gets it <laughs> exactly because this is the thing. Okay, so ready? Uh, this is serious, ready? Now you know that there's a return of Christ consciousness. I'm about to just like hit you guys in the face so hard. Right? Ready? Right now, we're going through a huge rebirth of Christ consciousness. Now, that, the Christ consciousness is love and free will. That's a choice, right? Welcome back, Christ consciousness. Did she say what I think she said? Oh! <laughs> Now, yeah, like, so, so what, so Christ as a consciousness is a collective consciousness. Now, what it's done is fragmented into thousands of people on the planet. So, like, literally, there will be many people you shake hands with, and that's actually a rebirth of Christ consciousness. Now, here's the, yeah. <laughs> Well, here's the thing. If Christ consciousness reincarnates on the planet today as it is, do you think that it's going to be feeling wonderful? Ironically, this embodiment of the Christ consciousness of choice is actually suicidal. Do I want to be here is the choice. Crazy, right? Can I help people? Ready? I'm going to make this make even more sense because this is going to be hell. Right? Ready for this. What is the devil? Anybody know? Determinism. It's just the opposite of Christ consciousness. That's all it is. Determinism. That's the world you're living in today. What I just gave you an example of is determinism. I have no idea why I am walking. I have no idea why I'm making the decisions I'm making in my life today. I've never asked myself the question. There is no aspect of free will in this movement. I get this job because accounting is what my family's always done. I marry this person because this is the type of person that I should marry. I don't show anger because we don't show anger in this family. That's the devil. The devil's determinism. So literally, until you wake up to your own shadow and you start acting from free will, you are sided with the devil. This is why I laugh my ass off when I meet my Christians. <laughs> Trust me. If you've got a Christian who is born in a Christian household, who makes all the right Christian decisions, they are more the devil than anyone else. There is no free will. So... 
Next time you see those guys standing on the corner like, Jesus will save you, everyone else is gonna fucking die. Like, <laughs> that's the devil, oh my God. <laughs> Now, I'll give a whole speech later about how basically what Christ consciousness and the choice to love is, it means love the devil. So loving the aspects that are trapped in determinism is actually how to move into the uh, expanded form of Christ consciousness. Long story. But for now, you have to understand the difference between you and everyone else is you have free will. That's I, terrifying. I know. <laughs> I know, but look, as everyone else, I'm just comfortable enough to never consider killing myself. But I have no idea why I am doing what I'm doing. <sighs> so from a universal perspective, that whole charade I just did was to explain to you that this thing that keeps happening to you, where you're like, I don't really know if I want to be here or if I want to crash my car into the divider at 70 miles an hour. We can make this a little bit healthier if you'd like, but it's a choice point. It means you are actualizing your free will. Okay, and that's where we're starting with the, the next, okay? You can sit down if you'd like. <coughs> If you weren't so unhappy with your life, it wouldn't look like, I wonder if I should crash my car into a divider at 70 miles an hour. It would look like, do I really want to be doing this today? So the expanded version for you is to get from that place to that place. So... Actually, come back up on stage. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> okay, I'm gonna, can I explain to you why you're suicidal and why somebody else who's in Christ consciousness might just ask the question, do I really want to be doing this today? Please. Desire is a very interesting aspect of collective consciousness. Desire is what fuels the expansion of source consciousness. Where is my stuff? Oh, well, I'm going to have to figure this out without props. Ready? You can't help but desire in life. Hate to break it to you guys. It's not going to be possible for you not to desire. I mean, impossible. Even if you say, I want to not have desire, it's a desire. Desire was always meant to occur within the collective consciousness or your individual consciousness because it creates the expansion. That's how source knows itself. So this is your life. You can't stop wanting, right? Let's say you're born in a household that thinks you're worth total shit. <laughs> <laughs> to the degree that you suffer, that's the degree to which you desire. So you are going to be the person who gives rise to the extreme desire for love. Now, here's normal people, ready? This is normal people. Normal people is, oh my God, I just, I don't like that my parents want me to get good grades, I don't know. I wish that they just like me if I didn't get good grades. Look at the gap. Now this is what I want, this is where I am. Is this a very extreme gap? No. Pretty easy to close this gap, right? I can do things and say things and think things and maybe even create a different relationship with my parents that causes there to be no gap. I'm not in a lot of pain here because where what I want is versus where I am is not very big. All your pain in life is about this gap. However, if I desperately want to be loved, like I need somebody to love me and want me so bad I can't see straight, And yet I'm here with someone treating me like I'm a fucking mistake every day. You see where I am now? This gap is so big for me, now I want to fucking kill myself. Because literally, this is why people are suicidal. I don't see a way to close this gap. 
This is the same as, as like literally closing this gap for me on an emotional level. It's emotional for you. On an emotional level, closing this gap for you is the same as it is for somebody starving to death in the Sahara to get into Whole Foods. Like if you landed and you said, look, it's possible to have nothing but an endless supply of the most amazing foods you've ever had. And like every, I mean, so much food that it just goes rotten on the shelf. This is what that feels like to that person. There is no way to close the gap for them. But, they're, they're, but they're, this is the thing, there can't be an okayness in somebody not getting what they desire. You wanna know why? Because that's the expansion of the universe, the higher self, your soul stream, you understand by being born your two points of perspective. The minute you give rise to a desire, that aspect of you is actually in that vibration. So it's a ripping apart from within. You can't stand the gap. So the only option is through death. Because in death, you essentially line up with everything you've desired. That's why that experience is what it is. But this is what's happening with people who are suicidal. I can't figure out how to close the gap. I want that so bad, I do not conceive of a single freaking way I can get it. That's suicide. Because they understand at a higher level, in one fell swoop, they line up with it. But can I tell you why it doesn't benefit the universe? Because there's nothing to do past that. This universe is absolutely on the side of you getting everything you want. I mean, literally, all it may not seem like this, but all forces are actually for it. Because it does not benefit the universe for you to not get everything you wanted. For this reason. The universe can't expand unless desire expands. So unless I, let's say this is a million dollars, I don't care what it is, okay. <laughs> unless I actually get a million dollars, I can't desire more. And then line up with it. And then desire more. And then line up with it. And as Source is doing this dance, it's constantly learning about itself, right? So there is no universal expansion unless there is a continuation of desire. Now obviously if I kill myself, so I line up with this thing that I've desired in this life. Is there any movement forward? There's no more desire, so there's no more expansion. So the universe doesn't get anything more out of this. The only option is to come back into another embodiment that creates desire. Now, one of my main motivations, if you'd like to know, for not committing suicide is that the likelihood of you choosing into similar contrast is very high. I know that sucks. It's not a great reason to stay here. I could give you other reasons, and I will give you other reasons, but from universal perspective, it's very different than it is when you're in the game. I know you know what this is like, because when you're playing a video game, when you crash into a barricade, it's not a huge deal for you, is it? You better believe if you're in the game, you're like, ah! Like, yeah, it would not be the same experience, right? <laughs> but that's how it is here for us. We're the avatars. It's a very real experience for us. But when you die, from source perspective, it's not, oh my God, I had the most miserable life possible never doing that again. It's, wow, look at all the expansion I got from that. And I didn't go far enough with it because I never lined up with it. <laughs> and now you see my dilemma. Oh, believe me, I'm intimate with it. Yes. Very. Yeah. So, what's the answer? At this point, as you s clearly shown everyone, that gap is very, very extreme for me. Yeah. So we. So there's literally one option, and that's to close the gap. So all your focus needs to be on what that gap is about, what it is you're wanting so bad, and how you can get there. Well, it's weird. I love everyone, and I hate everyone yes. at the same time. And the guilt comes from the fact that the things that I want, I feel like other people are going to be denied in order for me to get them. Why? 
I feel like life is a zero-sum game. The only way that one can win is if someone else loses. So Okay, so this is what has to change in your own mentality. Do you believe in oneness? No. I would rather you be honest in that way. Good. Why? Why don't you believe in oneness? Well, it took me um, losing someone that I really cared about to kind of understand that ultimately a lot of these patterns that I have in my life came from my parents, that in order for me to move forward, I have to examine those patterns and figure out where each one of those come from. And believe me, I do believe you when you say there are thousands of them. <laughs> there are thousands. <laughs> so um, examining each part, you know, gets me to a point where it's like time to, time to run into the divider. And when I get from that point to, okay, now I want something, then I'm like, well, in order for me to want it, other people have to not get it. In my family, I was a golden child, and then I became the black sheep. Yep. You, um, I don't know if you realize this, but you did the video on school shooters, mm -hmm. and I have been having that video on repeat. That is pretty much my life, pretty much, right down to the T. And so I went the self-harm way mm -hmm. instead of the harm everyone else way. Me too. Wow. Okay. Have you seen my arms? You have tattoos on them. What do you think they cover? Scars. Yeah. See, the difference is though, I don't, I don't want to feel pain anymore. Like. Do you think I do? No, absolutely <laughs> not. <laughs> I mean. That's the, that's the problem. The reason why I don't believe in oneness is because if oneness truly existed, how can I be in this much pain and no one else sees it? I see it. I see it. Well, I appreciate it. You know? <laughs> Household I grew up in, you know, I, I swear to God, I thought this entire talk was going to be a complete waste of time until you started talking about parents and the dial complex. I was that dial mm -hmm. on both sides from yep. the part where, you know, as long as I was a good child, everyone loved me and gave me all the resources and gave me everything that they desired. Then at 15 years old, I realized who I really was. We fucking hate you. Mm -hmm. But we, they don't say they fucking hate you. They kind of go, oh, we love you so much, and then wow. never, never call you, never text you, never come by your house. Everyone knows your address. Everyone knows your phone number. It hasn't changed in years. Yep. And then when you have a life situation where it's like you're rock bottom, guess what they tell you? Um, I hope you end up a vegetable. No one in your life matters. You suck. I know you're talking about killing yourself, but really, whatever. Do you want me to tell you why you don't believe in oneness? Please. It's called disconnection. I will demonstrate it for you. <laughs> okay, you're going to be the parent, like he had, that only cares about what you want. Just literally start acting like that. Watch our interaction. I'm, I'm his kid, okay?
Oh, I, what I want you guys to watch right now, I have two options. Do you see this? My option is I either endear myself to this. Because th you understand this doesn't care about me, right? You can see that from the energy? The, this is out for itself. I have, I have two options. Either I can endear myself to this. Now, I, I, to do that, I have to disconnect from me. And I start mirroring this parent. So as, as this parent walks forward, I, I go, oh, this is how I stay safe. So I, my only way of staying connected to this parent is to disconnect to my real self. Okay? My other choice is, which isn't really a choice I get to make, if I can't do that, what are you going to do? See this opposition? This is a push away. This parent is not okay with me being me. So that push away makes me have to disconnect completely. Either way, I've learned that it's impossible for this one to take my best interests into account. I'm not part of this parent. Do you hear what I said? I can't experience the oneness that's inherent to this universe because this parent does not take me as part of itself. If a parent took this child as part of itself, my feelings would have to matter, right? If I was a part of this parent, then my unhappiness is his unhappiness. He better fix it. Otherwise, he can't be okay. But... This is not the experience I'm having. I become dislocated from the truth of oneness here because my only option with this parent is to fend for myself. This is the demon of disconnection. Now, remember how I said that this is the typical style of relationship in the home. This is not abnormal. We're just, everyone's falling somewhere on the scale here. That person only cares about themselves, which puts me in the position to only care about myself. I better. You see? So now I'm disconnected. My way of coping is to do the same thing he did. It, this is the beginning of the zero-sum game. This parent sends the message, my way or the highway. So I'm like, okay, fine, then I have to. This is what you got to get. A, zero, a, a person who plays a zero-sum game forces you to play a zero-sum game. There is no other option. And so what you have is all these people. This is the neighborhood you grew up in. All these people who grew up like this. The message from day one was you fend for yourself. Okay, so I'm going to. It's not the truth but it's the way everyone's had to cope with each other. That's why you don't believe in oneness. You know, the funny thing is, while she was doing that entire demonstration, I was just thinking to myself, like, he was, if he was my father right now, I was imagining this like a knife and just kind of stabbing him over and over again. Because it is so painful. Remember, wanting to, wanting to hurt someone is wanting to create empathy. It's that we feel like oneness is so impossible. It's so impossible to be part of that person that I need to force them into it. And, I, and everyone here has felt that feeling where like someone's hurting you and you're like, God damn, I wish this would happen to you. That's a normal reaction because you want empathy, which is oneness. That's what empathy is. Compassion and empathy is I am you. I get it. So what I've done in my current point in my life is I haven't even approached the situation. I have simply said, you know, the situation is so toxic yep. that I must abandon it completely in order to even save any part of my sanity. 
And <clears throat> now I'm at a crossroads where a lot of people remind me of similar people that I grew up with in my family. And you know, in order for you know, in order for me to believe in oneness, I have to believe that those people could embody some sort of personality characteristics of the people that I knew in my life. So in a sense, it's like I'm at sort of a logical, like dividing by zero type thing, where it's like, okay, well, if this person is like your mom, then they're going to be exactly like your mom. So you hate your mom, so you might hate this person. <laughs> This other person reminds you of your aunt who you hate. This person reminds you of this. So it's like it's this never-ending cycle of, well, everyone is the same. So everyone has similar desires and similar motivations. So if I meet someone that looks like them, I immediately go, well. And it, it, doesn't even, it goes immediate from that first point of view of judgment. And then it goes even further as I get to know them. Like, oh, my God, I'm matching. I'm matching. I'm matching. This is going to be horrible. Where do I go from there? How do I discount? How do I? Because in in my particular case, the way I see it is, I only have like two options: disconnect from them or have them disconnect from reality. It depends on what the healing experience actually was for you. No, this is where this is going to get painful for some people here because what the universe is doing by running you into a reenactment. You recognize that it's doing that, right? You run into the person who's exactly like mom or exactly like dad, is it's giving you another opportunity for healing. Do you understand what healing is? I'm gonna tell you. It's to experience the opposite. Like if you, if you just, you can understand healing in 30 seconds if you understand that sentence. Because we love to be like, oh God, what does that mean? Healing is so complicated, not complicated. If a bone is broken, to heal the bone is to put it back together again. If someone's lonely, to heal is to get companionship. To heal is always, and nothing ever more than, to experience the opposite. So the universe will put you in the position to experience the opposite. But this is where it gets kind of painful because for some of you to experience the opposite was to have the parent change and for some of you especially if you were in really horrific situations in childhood to experience the opposite was to lose the parent now when you were a child if you couldn't get away from that person Potentially, the healing experience is to be in an exact reenactment and get away this time. That's my bad news for some of you, because it's not always going to happen that you run into a person who is a reflection of this person in your childhood, and they're going to change to be the one to give you the opposite experience. Especially for some of us that were meant to be adopted. For a lot of us, it's about getting in the same painful experience, walking away, and having somebody else say, I'll take you instead. And through that person, having a different experience. You just used the word adopted. <laughs> um, funny thing is a backstory. My grandparents were trying to adopt me as their own because they saw me as a golden child in their reality. So it's kind of like, I don't even know if that would make a difference. Like I came, I came to, cause I'm, I'm thinking, you know, I'm trying so many different things to sort of resolve that whole oneness paradox. I, I call it a paradox cause it's like, okay, if you know me, how can you not understand why I'm in this much pain? So if you're going to remind me of people in my life, I can't change them. The one person that reminded me of my mom, uh, grandmother, grandfather, they sort of let themselves go at a young age. So, and I feel bad for them because I feel like they're just going to come back in an even worse situation, have to deal with all this over again. They might off themselves again and then just keep doing it over and over. I mean, I don't know. I guess, I guess it's embracing that oneness that's hard for me right now. Embracing that is really, really hard. That's because I, you shouldn't be embracing oneness. You should be going in the direction of relationships with people who can take you as part of themselves. 
you mentioned with the last man um, a point about intimacy where you directly go into a traumatic situation from your life mm -hmm. or just in general a traumatic feeling in order to try to create connection with Not people. just traumatic, it could be anything, but I'm just saying like something you wouldn't normally volunteer to someone you just met. I yeah. just chose that because it was a really provocative statement. That has went disastrous for me, actually. Why? Why? Well, in the LGBT community, especially for gay males, there's a high value placed on perfection. Well, there's, there's a serious terror of intimacy. Of course there is. Our well, fathers like, hate us. Yes. <laughs> They hate everything about us. They hate everything that we came to be. And you know, if, to be truthful, if I'm a reflection of my father, how can you hate up something that's a part of you? Mm -hmm. So I end up finding a lot of people that I guess dislike me because I must be weak for feeling like, oh my God, I came from such a terrible situation. I'm telling you about it. So I'm just dumping my problems on you. Do you think that I would go into a cheerleader rally and dump that information in front of someone? There is such a thing as discernment. Discernment. Like what I'm saying is like, see, I, I wanted to make everyone aware of the fact that you're sitting in a room full of like-minded people right now. Mm -hmm. This is a good place to do what I just said. In being brave as I am, honestly, I would probably do it with whoever I ran into, whether they were on the plane or whatnot, but I, w I would not go into a cheerleader rally and be like, I tried to commit suicide when I was little. <laughs> They're going to be like, okay, super special for you, bye. Yeah, that's, that's actually what I've been doing, like the I know. whole thing. There's a saying, I hate this saying because one of my exes used to say it, but let's just be honest. <laughs> Okay, so I have this ex, and one of his favorite things to say is, don't throw pearls before a swine. I need a little bit more meaning on that one, if you don't mind. What's going to happen if you put a pearl in a mud slop with a pig? They're not going to appreciate it at all. Exactly. So why the hell would you do it in the first place, unless you wanted to get hurt? I can't be that much better than everybody else. That's, I mean, yeah, you did a video on humility and that is very, very toxic. And it's just like at the same time, well, if I consider myself so much better than other people what or special. What does that do with being better than anyone else? Well, it's just like considering myself as a person in general is like considering myself better than other people. No, everyone's personal truth is a pearl. Everyone's personal truth is a pearl. Do you see? So am I supposed to just let all of them go? Just, just let them dissolve in a sea of hatred? Am I supposed to not help them in some way? The people in your life? Anyone. Does it feel good to help them? Then yes. If it feels not so good to help them, then drop it. So leave the family behind, leave the friends behind. You want me to be honest with you? Yes, please. Where your family is vibrationally, creating change within that family is not going to happen. Yeah, a lot of people have been telling me that. <laughs> you know, and yeah, if you're, if you're going to call me an embodiment of, conscious, of Christ consciousness, then yes, you know, Jesus died for our sins, and that's because he loved no. humanity. He didn't no. die for our sins. No, who said that? Chris, I'm, I'm come from a Christian household. Oh, I know, and I would like to wake you up. Ready? <laughs> <laughs> I don't mean to be like that. I'm, I'm getting away from it. It's just that, yeah. How do you, how do you know Christ himself said that? <laughs> if I was Christ himself, I would have smited everybody if I had that power. I really would have. You're going to nail me to a cross just because I love you. I wash people's feet because I care about them. I make miracles happen. And you are exalting the concept of Christ as a martyr. Absolutely nothing he said. 
Christ was Buddhist. Do you understand what I mean by that? His entire practice was love. That's it. Like, the, literally, the teachings don't even go beyond that. Which was revolutionary at the time. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Okay. <laughs> I'm going to tell you where your concepts about Christ came from. You ready? It did not come from his mouth. Now, I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to scare the crap out of you here. Because, like, let's take me, for example. I have 20-something people living in my intentional community. You could consider these disciples. They live and die and breathe my teachings. I force them to pretty much every day. <laughs> There's no way out. <laughs> um, if I gave each one of them a book, because I'm illiterate, by the way, if I gave each one of them a book and a pen and I said, write my teachings for the world, what do you think would happen? <laughs> yeah, you'd get 20 different versions, each of which are pushed through the particular filter that that person has for them. And I can't tell you how often even the people who live with me come up to me and say, well, it's like you say this. And I'm like, that's not the meaning of that at all. <laughs> like, at all. And that's the people who live with me. This is your Bible. It's coming through the filter of people who didn't even live at the same time. Most of them never even met Christ. That's how scary that should be. Now, it gets more scary. The people who were converting to Christianity, which Christ was not a Christian, never called himself a Christian, that was created by someone else. But the people who are trying to convert people who are, in, who are Jewish to Christianity needed people to, to do that. I need people to convert. Are people pretty manipulative when they want someone to convert? So what they did, knowing all of the Jewish scriptures, is that they looked for how to make people accept Christ. So what they did is they said, oh, you know, there's this whole story about what the, the next Jewish Messiah is going to be. He's going to be heralded by a star. He's going to be, his birth will be foretold by the gifts of three kings. This is Jewish prophecy. Now what they did is they wrote it in so that Christ fit those criteria. There is no nativity. Christ was not born in a manger. He certainly was not around a man when he was born. At that time, that would have been complete heresy. Consequently, he went wandering through India for years upon years, figuring out Buddhist philosophy, which is where he stumbled on the concept of love and brought it back, thank God. But basically, what you know about Christ is not accurate. Christ is not a martyr. Never was. It wouldn't make sense to him. Also, never understood. If you, if you like, talked to Christ today and you said the word devil, he'd be like, what's that? Not a concept. It smacks much more of culture. That's why when you read it, it's like, thou shalt not covet thy neighbor's wife, and thou shalt not wear two cloths of the same, you know, like, type of thread, and all of the stuff that was typical to thousands upon thousands of years ago in the Middle East. So your concept of Jesus is completely false. In no way did he say, I'm dying for your sins. The guy just literally said, freaking love each other, and everyone was like, we'd rather hate each other. <laughs> <laughs> That's what I'm running up into. Well, he was a social revolutionary. This is what to understand about Jesus. Jesus was a social revolutionary. In a time period when it was not okay to ever share the space with a prostitute, he was kind of like Martin Luther King is for blacks. He was like, well, I shall bring one with me then. <laughs> <laughs> That's why he ended up on a cross. 
social revolutionaries end up on a cross. Whether it's an actual cross or a gunshot through the head. Is there value to be had in knowing that truth about your life and continuing to live as if that's not your truth? Well, the reason why I ask that is sort of a confusing question. Well, it was really confusing. Basically, it's like I have so much guilt about that gap, about the fact that, well, now everyone's telling me that, you know, fuck them. So, yeah, that makes sense. It's, completely. Not, it's not fuck them. I, well, I feel like that, though. Well, I know because you've been so, so hurt. It's, 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 I'm never gonna get it. It's more painful than what you're in, actually. When you're in hurt, like hurt that you wanna hate them, it's actually more empowered than the genuine pain of realizing I am never gonna get it from this person who I need it from worse than anything in the world. That's your reality. And you're gonna have to accept that that's your reality in the same way that you have to accept someone's dead. I'm talking the most intense type of loss you can experience. It's like the, I, I, it's almost like you're sitting on the outside of, a, of the castle walls and knowing that they're inside. And you're going to have to get to the point where you accept they are never going to open the door. It does not matter what happens, what you try to change, nothing will open the door. Is there value even helping those people at all? Not even, not even a little bit. No, why? Why? What well, is it, what is it going to do if you help them? Seriously. Okay. Well, <clears throat> I'm taking it from the point of view of me coming up here on stage to speak to you about the fact that I want to kill myself. Mm -hmm. And there are a lot of people who pretty much said, "Well, you know, what I mean, you want to kill yourself, but look at so look at what you've done in your life." No, don't ever listen to the only people who say that are people who have never been suicidal. If you are lacking genuine connection, nothing you have done in your life should fucking matter. What would at this point? Only getting connection. Only getting the relationships you were starved of. That's it. There will be no success you ever create that will ever come close to the need for that. Nothing. Even if it means extremely drastic changes. Especially... It means extremely drastic change, yes. That's what it means when you're in any type of a terminal situation. Whether it's terminal cancer or suicidality, it all leads to the same road, doesn't it? If I continue with this, I die. Yeah, you better believe that that calls for drastic changes. Okay, so I do get to believe I'm terminally ill, okay. Yes, actually, that's what this is. Suicidality is a terminal illness. It's I can't keep living the same way that I'm living right now. I will die. That's literally what will happen. That's why, you know, we're trying to change all kinds of things within the, even the mainstream now realizes that what they're doing with suicidality doesn't work. Why? Because the same people you see there on Monday are the same people there next week. If the conditions don't change, you will die. Yes. So the place that I would be in, have been in, when I'm in your position is, this will lead to death. So either I keep walking down the road to death, or I literally make such drastic changes, because it doesn't matter anymore. It's the same thing that somebody with a terminal cancer does when they're like, well, I'm dying in two months. What am I going to do with two months? Now the ones, I can tell you this even personally, the ones who get better are the ones who make that choice. To actually live with the only life they have left. But I mean in a really committed way. And that's the problem with suicidality. You're sitting on the fence. You can't live an okay life and even have a chance at it if you sit on the fence. So I guess I need to start with figuring out why I'm, f why I'm still sitting on the fence? No, you know why you're still sitting on the fence. Because you think that getting off the fence is just going to end in futile futility. It's just going to be more pain.
You only become suicidal if it's futility. I can't close the gap. That's your thought. I need to figure out how to close that gap. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> yes, everyone, I did have to sit there a little minute. That, that gap is very big, though. Oh, I know. It's giant. I can see it, I know. Yeah, so... Um, Listen to me. You did not bite off an easy life. It's not your path. It's going to be really super painful to realize that other people chose an easier path than you. Takes one to know one. <laughs> if you put the energy that you put into questioning whether you wanted to be here into what you're going to do to close that gap, you would actually get somewhere. Regardless if I think I may die the next day. Especially if you think you may die the next day, because it doesn't matter, does it? Can I tell you the blessing that came out of my suicidal path? I realized eventually that I could always kill myself tomorrow. It's an incredible relief. When you're in that low of a frequency, a place most people will never touch, you could always kill yourself tomorrow. Use it as a safety net. You can do that. People in mainstream hate when I say that. But it's the reality. You can use it as a safety net. You can always kill yourself tomorrow, at which point it's not going to fucking matter, is it? Because you'll be gone. So what are you going to do today? And if you're going to make that choice to use that, I can kill myself tomorrow. If you're going to use it as a safety net, you better freaking commit to today. Not like, I don't know today, but like fully, what am I doing today? Do whatever I want, no consequences. I'm not into hurting people like that. I'm really not. So that's not something I want to do. It's just, you know, I, I don't. Know, I know who you are. You just want to feel better. So put your energy into whatever would make you feel better here and now. That's it. For me, it was skiing. People are like, wow, it's so amazing. You used to be a professional skier. I'm like, yeah, wait until you hear the story about how I got there. <laughs> <laughs> no, literally, like, I got you. I, I can tell you the story. Ready? So I, in my teen years, I tried to commit suicide um, three times in my teens. And yeah, yeah, yeah. a horrible relationship with everybody around me, basically. And I, I realized this thing. You know, I could always kill myself tomorrow. What am I going to do with today? And, of course, I've got my parents sitting here being like, oh, we need her to go to college. I mean, come on. She graduated when she was 16 fucking years old. Like, this is, she's supposed to be a prodigy. Like, what the hell's going on? My mother had to get to the point where she actually got, oh, my fucking daughter's going to die. Like, I don't get to have expectations anymore. College is out the window if my daughter's going to fucking die. So... I looked at my mother, and she's like, what do you want to do? I'm like, I don't fucking know. I don't even know what I want. I don't even know what I like. I guess I could try to ski today. I don't know. <laughs> See, so it's no longer about the things I have to do. It's literally like what, anything you could shoot a dart at that might feel like any relief. That's where you are from where you are vibrationally. Now, so I said that to my mom. She goes, all right, fine. Gordy, which is what she calls my dad. I need you to go buy Teal a season pass. So they bought me a season pass. I got it in my hand. I was like, fuck, fine. All right, committing to life today. I'm going to drive up the canyon. And I felt a little bit of relief. So I went back the next day. And I went back the next day. And I went back the next day. And believe me, you've got a very fast-moving stream. If you've got that much of an intensity to your gap, you've got a very intense stream of consciousness. Whatever you put energy into, 
This is why you experience success that fast. So basically, in a period of a month, I'm already racing. I'm entering races. This is sort of fun. Now I've got some focus. That turned into a professional career for me, which got me out of the freaking place I was living. It gave me a reason to live for a certain amount of time. But all I did was chase relief. It took me probably a week of skiing before I realized I, didn't, I wasn't really needing suicide tomorrow. It was like, oh, maybe I could commit suicide in a week. <laughs> now, that's actually a really huge improvement. It sounds dismal, unless you're in that type of a space, but like literally realizing, and it's not like it was conscious, just realizing, oh, wait, I haven't thought about suicide today. That was a huge improvement. So, I can always commit suicide tomorrow. Turns to, I can, always co I can commit suicide in a week. I can commit suicide in a month. What am I going to do with it? And believe me, it's not like, the road to healing is not like this. It's like layers of the onion. So I got back in time periods in my life, always after a failed relationship, where it was like, I'm back in it again. Then I had to use it again. All right, I'm back to, I'm gonna, I can commit suicide tomorrow. And you just keep playing it over again. And it got better and better each time. But you got, you can't, you, I, got, I need you to get what I got when I was 19. You are never going to be able to live a life that feels good. And there is no reason to stay here unless you're willing to actually commit to it, even if it's for a day. Like you can't fence it and have an okay life. It's not possible. So it's like, I'm either going to actually give it a shot, knowing that's always a backup, or I haven't even started. You get that? It's like it, f fence sitting, it's a guarantee you will never feel good in life. Like, it's, you already know your fate. If I can use this sort of, I can commit suicide later, but really super commit to life here, I at least have a shot at the potential. So, it was a dismal day. I get to either commit suicide today, knowing that by fence sitting, I am already in that shit space. Or I get to actually commit. And not like saying committing, actually commit. I think my last part with that <clears throat> is I still have to eat. I still have to have a house. You know, those are things that I want, the material things I want at least. So while I'm in this practice of doing what I would like to do. Then so that's a personal choice. That's a personal choice. A lot of people don't make that choice. I know a lot of people on the streets. They don't make that choice. So it's a personal choice. It's fine to make that choice. You understand that it's a personal choice to do your shitty job, right? <laughs> oh, come on, I still gotta keep it <laughs> for a little bit. It's fine, then make that choice, but like actually consciously make it. You don't get to like make that choice, but then resent the, the choice you made. You guys, you really get, you gotta get to a place of freedom in life where you are ready to take the keys to your house and throw them down a freaking drain. That's the level of freedom that I want you all to have in your life. So that at least if you're going to the job, you choose to do it. You know what, Till? I want to sit with that. Okay. Thank you very much. I see Blink sauntering at me. <laughs> <laughs> This <laughs> 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 <laughs>